Yeah, 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 yeah. Just my mum, my brothers and my sisters, straight in a taxi and you're going up to the airport and straight to Britain. We didn't know where we were going, what was happening. We were totally just confused. So what happened was there was this big team of the, the, the Skinner group coming down to our city. So we wanted to do something about it. Mm. So then my mother said a couple of weeks, a couple of months after that, when we had a chat, she said, put it this way. You would have gone there. You would have killed someone or someone would have killed you. And one way or another, I would have lost my sons. So we can't win. Yeah. No so way. the only way to win was to escape from there. So you lot then have to face this. And because my uncle lived in London, he gave my mom some money to get us over here. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we came over here, things started changing. But at the beginning, to me, there was no change. Everything was the same. Mm -hmm. To me, when I arrived in Britain, there was another white country, another bunch of white people. So to me, everyone here was the same as the people in Poland. I didn't see no difference. So then uh, when was we arrived... Treated, it, sorry, was you treated differently though? When I came to England. England. It was still... Because we didn't speak the language, mm, yeah, the the barrier was still there. Mm -hmm. So I still felt they came across quite aggressive. They came across quite strict. They quite, so everyone we were sort of dealt with when we arrived here, which was the police officers, which was the the um, the immigration officers, and everybody else who was there. They're very very strict. So it still felt they were against me. So when we arrived, they put us into this camp. We stayed in the camp for two weeks, and after two weeks, we were allowed in the country. So some families were in these camps for like six months, a year. What's the camps like? Oh, like a prison camp, seriously. <laughs> really? Bob wire, you've got these small rooms, bunk beds, kind of a military type mm. unit. Um, what, families just live in these? They rooms get put together. there and you, what, what they do, they make it really difficult for you to put so much pressure on you that you leave. And every day someone comes and says, I've got tickets for you to go back home. No way. Every day you're offered tickets, go back home. Because... Mm. Put it this way, if life is really bad, you take anything. Because yeah. anything is better than back there. Yeah. But if it's obviously not that bad, you take a ticket and you go back home. Is that, is that why you think they do it? That's why they do it. So it it's it's really a system. It's yeah. a process. The food is awful. But I guess there is some people that do... That would use that. that yes. That use that system. So it's oh, 100%. too close to it, isn't it? Oh, 100%. There's, there's, there's people like you who are actually... Yes, who really need it. There's people probably just looking to get into the country. Again, for a better life. Yes. And I do understand that. But yes. Again, it's it's one of those things where immigration and, and that's all got a different... Definitely, definitely. The food is just awful. Um, every day we just had our upset stomachs because <laughs> the food was just that bad. Um, so we stayed there for two weeks and literally every day my mother argued with them. Literally every day she gave them hell. All you could hear is just my mother at the end of the corridor just shouting at them. <laughs> um, and she was amazing. Do you know what I mean? She just kicked ass. She just went there and she just wouldn't give in because she knew we had to get in. She knew she couldn't go back home. Mm -hmm. yeah. That wasn't an option. So then after two weeks, they they said, you guys can go. So then we were put on this bus. Uh, from the bus, we moved to a train. On the train, we arrived in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. We don't know what this is, where this is. We don't know nothing. But you never even heard of it, did you? No, we, we didn't know this existed. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's one of those things. Yeah. What year was this that you arrived in? 2001. 2001. Yeah. 2001. But um, it was one of the coolest things because it was one of the best places I could ever be put. Okay. Do you know what, to me to today, that? if I was in London, yeah, I might have got in with the wrong people, the wrong things, because it's so accessible. Yeah. Okay. But within Plymouth, it's so we could say a bit slower here. Yeah. You haven't got as much of the trouble and the drugs yeah. and everything and else. And like All that. of that wasn't as bad. Um, imagine me being fourteen, yeah. being rebellious. Everything I went through. This would have been just a perfect spot for me to go and continue that journey, that rebellious journey. Yeah. Yeah. But I was lucky that I came to Plymouth and it was very calm and very subtle and very, very chilled space. Yeah, it's an interesting point though, because I thought, yeah, until, until you've just said that, which makes perfect sense. I think because even now, but I think certainly going back sort of 20 years, Plymouth isn't very multicultural. No. Compared to bigger cities like London oh, and Birmingham. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like coming over, suffering the racism that you had, you know, the Plymouth would have been one of the worst places. But yeah. but now you explain it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, definitely. So then when we came over here, um, we, were, we were put in the house and then we couldn't speak English. Nothing, so we didn't understand nothing. Um, one guy took us around the corner to get some cereal bread and just the basics so we could just eat for that evening when we arrived. Um, and then there were other difficulties when we, when we came here, which was... Um, the vouchers. So they never used to give you money, they used to give you food vouchers. Right. Um, and that was very embarrassing. And again, we were very, we were poor, 
but we're very proud of who we are. And going to a shop, I remember the situation. So there were, there were a couple of people behind me and I was going up to the line. I was buying bread and milk and everything for our family. And and that was in Summerfields, the shop that used to be. Summerfields? Summerfields. Oh, yeah, yeah, it used to be a shop that, called yeah. Summerfields. Yeah, I think Summerfields, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I recognise it, but I can't, I can't quite place. Yeah, I think it's a chain. I think, yeah, it's it? a chain. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was yeah. a Muddy Plain. Um, so I walked in there to, to get some food and stuff. And then I'm showing the lady this ticket and it says £20 on that. Um, and she said, you can't spend it because we can't give you cash change. And I haven't got any vouchers to exchange, so you can't buy it. But I was like, and I couldn't speak English very well, so I couldn't actually explain to her, yeah, but that's the food, so what am I going to do? How are we going to do this? Um, and she was really abrupt, and she was very rude, and she embarrassed me right in front of the whole shop. And she put the microphone thing on and said, um, whoever the manager was, I think it was something like Denise, hi, Denise, can you come to the front desk? I've got a refugee here with a, a voucher and I don't know what to do with it. You know, they just keep on coming in. I just don't know what you expect me to do. You put that over the loudspeaker? Right, over the loudspeaker so everyone could <laughs> no hear. Uh, and I'm stood there. I'm only 14, so yeah. I died wow. in my shoes. And only at that age, you want to be the coolest kid. You, you just want to walk in, you know. And kind of when we did it, we kind of hid slightly. So we'd be like passing it gently there so nobody kind of, kind of could see because it is embarrassing. So we were just passing that over. Um, and yeah, so there were a few moments and situations like this in my life when I came to Plymouth. Yes, there was still racism in Plymouth. 100% it wasn't as bad as back home. Did but you, it still existed. Did you find it was it was more racism or just ignorance? That people just weren't used to seeing different ethnic sort of groups in the city? Or do you think it was racism or a bit of both? I think experience? definitely a bit of both. Yeah. I, th I think definitely that there's a high, huge of, race, of, of kind of ignorance. Yeah. But the, the, the racism was still there. I think it's, um, it, a lot of it as well comes from like older generations, I always find. And that's like, you know, I, I think genuinely as, as generations are going on, yeah. Everyone's a lot more accepting. Like my boy yeah. is so accepting of everyone, oh, everything. Definitely, he's taught at school. Whereas if you speak to like an eighty-year-old, they're a lot less accepting. Yeah, you know, and and I think those cultural differences is maybe down to they just never even had the, yeah, they they never never had, had the experience. They never had the opportunity. I mean, the same thing with me is like. Uh, so my teacher at uh, Lipson, which was an amazing lady, she was an incredible person who taught me a really vital lesson. Mm -hmm. So I had, we would say, chip on my shoulder uh, about white people. And I dislike white people because what happened to me? So one day she said, um, Toby, going in the classroom, you're going to be copying this 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 book into the computer so I can learn my spellings mm -hmm. and how to use a computer. So I'm sad to type and type and out spellings and read and writing. It's not my thing, not interested. I feel it was a waste of time for me. So anyway, I hated that anyway. So then I'm sat there typing, typing. I just got so angry, so frustrated. Just pushed the keyboard back and I said, I hate white people. You're always making me do stuff. And she looked at me, she said, how dare you? I said, what did you just say? And then I was like, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Mm. I said something I shouldn't have. And I love that lady for that because she called me out. Mm. And she went, how dare you say that, Toby? She said, actually, you know what? How many white people do you know? I went, I don't know. She said, no, just on your hand, just please tell me how many white people do you know? And I had to really think and I thought, I know you because we talk every day, because we work together with us. I know you, I know your husband, and I know your son. So who else do you know? I said, nobody. Because you were the first people I mixed with. She said, do you hate me then? I said, no. She said, why? I said, because you're very kind. She said, do you hate my husband? I said, no. She said, why? Because he's kind. She said, do you hate my son? I said, no. Why? Because he's kind. So the three white people you know are kind, and yet you hate everybody. And it taught me a lesson that because in Poland, everyone done that to me, put everyone together in one group. I did the same. Yeah, it happens all the time, though, doesn't it? So it was my knowledge, my experience kind of caused the same effect. So I disliked it, yet I did it. So it taught me a lesson not to judge people in a group. I can judge individuals. And then the individuals I've met were not nice. They were just unkind people. But it wasn't everybody. It's not the whole race. It's not the whole religion. It's not the whole culture. There were just a couple of people that I've met that were really mean. Yeah. And that taught me a really big lesson. So she was an incredible teacher to call me out and learn that lesson that day.